O God, who knows us to be set in the midst of so many dangers by reason of the frailty of our nature, give us wisdom, insight, light, perseverance. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, we are now with uh, Canon Dixon on uh, Volume 2, at page 18, on the closure of the monasteries in England. We're talking about a couple of commissioners, Legg and Leighton. But if those of Legg were the more numerous, the trophies reared within the same space of time by Leighton may claim to have been the more splendid. Legg, as it has been shown, often stooped to small and wicked game, while Leighton kept himself in general to those higher abodes where there was wealth and where the reputation of virtue remained to be removed by dexterity. The scene of his activity lay in the east and south, and at Northampton in the month of March, he, had, he first discerned conducting the surrender of the Cluniac Priory of St. Andrew of the revenue of about 300 pounds, a house in which, on a former in visitation, he had noted no other evils than debt and involvement. There he may have received the, that confession of guilt subscribed by the prior in a convent of 12 monks, which has done service in history as if it were a specimen of the numerous confessions believed to have been made by monks and nuns, nuns which have been alleged in vindication of the proceedings of King and Parliament in suppression. I've already expressed the opinion that this is not a specimen, but a solitary instance of a confession signed by the hands of a convent in which some kind of admission of moral guilt is to be found. But that to assume that there were many or any others like it is by no means warrantable. The document upon examination turns out to be a curious affair in itself and proves at least if it were composed by the convent who set their hands to it, that the literary art as it was practiced at the time was not neglected in that fraternity. It occupies in the author who first printed it nearly four large folio pages, the essential clause which gives the acknowledgement of moral turpitude which has seen such heavy service may be read in several of the more accessible historians bloated, fulsome, and rotund as an act of Parliament, volleying, volleying forth endless revolutions of phraseology. It seems to consist of nothing but words. Never was penitent so well ordered, the smitten breast so studious of good sackcloth, contrition so wide-mouthed, resignation so careful of the advantage of those to whom it resigned itself, as when the monks of Northampton set forth the manifold negligences, enormities, and abuses of long time by them and others of their predecessors, under the pretense and shadow of perfect religion, used and committed to the grievous displeasure of Almighty God, the crafty deception, subtle deception, seduction, of the pure and simple minds of their good Christian people of the realm. Their vain ceremonies grieved them, their idolatry they owned and lamented. They confessed their neglect of hospitality, and in a somewhat vague and or overflourished phrase, they acknowledged carnal depravity. <coughs> they surrendered themselves, as they said, without coercion. And so loyal were they that they made for the supreme head a claim which had not yet been put forth on his own behalf and gave him a title which he had never challenged. The supreme head being consequently in general reformator, Weaver's funeral monuments, he appears to have believed without seeing that there were many others the rest of the abbots, priors, abbesses, and prioresses at other times, with unanimous consent of their convict convents and great compunction of spirit, contrition of heart, and confession of their manifold enormities, 
did severally give and grant to the king's majesties and his heirs all the rights and instruments, lands, goods. Henry was acting certainly as if it were his undoubted right to confiscate any religious house that he desired. He never advanced a claim to have the right of dissolving any that lay beyond the act for destroying those which had less than 200 pounds a year. Such is the confession of St. Andrews. The passage which historians give in part or wholly is as follows. I have put in italics the words about carnal depravity, as well as we are predestined predecessor called religious persons within your said monastery taking on us the habit of outward vesture of the said rule only to the intent to lead our lives in the idle quietness and not in the virtuous exercise in a stately es estimation and not obedient humility have under the shadow of color blah 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 in continual ingurgitations and farcings of our carnal bodies and of others, the supporters of our voluptuous and carnal appetite. Horrible abominations we've committed in our predecessors. It seems hardly worthwhile to pursue the questions which might be raised concerning the authentic nature voluntary character or value of a document which was signed in the presence of Leighton, and not only Leighton, but of Dr. Robert Southwell, attorney of the Court of Augmentations and of several other visitors. There can be no doubt, I suppose, that it was a form, perhaps of surrender, made ready by some official skilled in the language of the new royalty which was presented to the convent to be signed. So no duplicate copy signed by some other convent, convent seems to be preserved. It may perhaps be concluded that this form was found after a single trial too long and cumbersome for general rules for use. And that it was abandoned for the simple surrender without confession, which was indeed the only thing needful. For the rest, the monks of this house received pensions, the substantial rewards of penitence, all but one who was promoted to a living. And Leighton wrote to ask what he should do with the lead that covered the house. The great Cistercian Abbey of Stratford, Langthorne, in Essex, a 15 person and 600 pounds, was the next to receive the attack of this eminent practitioner. The Greater Merton, where the same number of Austin cannons enjoyed a revenue of a thousand pounds sunk before him. Battle Abbey of the same high value, where a fraternity of 17 ben Benedictines com commemorated the victory of the conqueror, yielded now to a more invincible invader. The new royal foundation of Bisham of 16 persons, the transitory monument of the piety of Henry VIII expired beneath his hand after a short exercise of the monastic virtues or vices within the first year of its establishment. Cobramer and Cheshire and Augustinian house defamed in the Comperta and in annual value not much smaller, 300 pounds, was easily dispatched and fell forthwith into the hands of the Cotton family. From thence, Leighton took his way to the earliest theater of his exploits, and the venerable, off-visited monastery of St. Augustine in Canterbury beheld him again. Already had that establishment been brought to surrender before another. Commissioner Hales in the previous year, but rather, whether for the sake of solemnity, through the hesitation of a scruple, with the design of doing honor to a veteran official, instantaneous dem demolition had not followed. The second of the pious foundations of the Christian king in England, of the lay father of the English church, was spared 
until the besom of destruction could be put into the hands of Leighton. The abbot, John Sturdy, alias Essex, and his monks, to the number of 30, were summoned to meet the mighty official in their chapter house, where they executed a surrender in the same form as before, and their dissolution watered the avidity of the king. It was observed with peculiar horror what the sacrilegious monarch turned the precincts of St. Augustine into a vivary of wild beasts, though by building or at least designing for himself also a palace among the ruins, he yielded to his enemies the consolation of an epigram. But the subversion of the great establishment seems not to have been completed even then, nor will the jewels and ornaments of the church were turned into the court of augmentations until much later in the reign of Henry. Leighton then returned to the city of Northampton, where the virtuous abbey of St. James of ten Austin canons was scarcely above the parliamentary mark in revenue, attracted and received the stroke. The poor order of the Gilbertines escaped him not. He dissolved their little house of Marmont and Cambridgeshire where a prior and convent of one monk or monastic canon resigned an income of ten pounds. <clears throat> the priory of Shudholm of nine canons, seven nuns, and about 150 pounds. These, like many other little houses of the order, had hitherto avoided the operation of the act. Transferring himself to Bedfordshire, he made an end of Chicksand, another Gil Gilbertine establishment, of which he had formerly made a merry report. This place was worth 250 pounds a year. The sight of it was granted immediately to snow. Leighton returned to Kent anon, where he destroyed the nunnery of Malling, a black sisterhood of eleven of somewhat greater revenue, but not very rich. The friars in their various orders had escaped hitherto because of their poverty beneath the meshes of the act, which was destroying the lesser houses of the monks and regular canons, and since they were neither named in the act nor possessed any fixed source of revenue to which the act could apply, it seemed not unreasonable to suppose that the provisions of the act had never been designed to be extended to them. But a piece of le legislation which was stretched upwards might be dragged downwards. If the friars had few farms or manors, they possessed houses. Those houses stood on ground, and therefore they had sites. A general attack was made on them this year, and we shall presently be called upon to admire the fervor and rapidity with which it was carried out. Meanwhile, we behold for a moment the two masters of dissolution, whose footsteps we have been following, brought together at the end of a year against the friars of London. On the 10th of November, 1538, Leg dissolved the white friars, who were 13 in number. On the 12th, he dissolved the Austin friars and the Minorites, Minorites, 13 and 26. On the same day, Leighton dissolved the Black Friars, 17 of all, of whom Hilsey, the Bishop of Rochester, was the commendatory prior. And it is probable that it was he who dissolved the Cross Friars also on the same day, who numbered six. Dr. Peter, whose name has already been mentioned before to the reader, must be named next in the prowess to the experienced leg in Leighton. To him there fell this year not less than 20 monasteries. And of these, if some were very small, others were of surpassing magnitude and wealth. The ancient Benedictine Abbey of Abingdon, with which he began, is said to have been renowned as a seat of religion even in the British times, and it had continued from the earliest English antiquity 
and had risen again at renewed splendor after the devastations of the Danes. But this great fraternity seems to have been now in a state of relaxed discipline. The abbot, at least, Thomas Pentecost, or Roland, who's named by Bale as a very immoral man, and on better evidence than that of Bale, it seems impossible to acquit the monastery of slothfulness and perhaps other vices. Peter found no difficulty here. The abbot was forward in surrendering, and so easily was the indignation of virtue appeased by the compliance of loyalty that the abbot not only received a very large pension, but was allowed to retain the manner of Cumnor in reward for his readiness. The convent of 25 black monks were dispersed into the world, and their large revenue, nearly 2,000 pounds, was confiscated to the crown. From Abingdon, Dr. Petra Peter proceeded to the Augustinian house of Butley in Suffolk, of which the commendatory was Thomas Manning, suffragan bishop of Ipswich. The eight black, black cannons of this place uh, resigned a revenue of about 400 pounds, and the site of their house was given to the Duke of Norfolk. Peter then passed into Worcestershire and received the ready but secret surrender of the great Benedictine Abbey of Evesham of the revenue of 1,200 pounds, which was tendered by Hollis, alias Bullard, the last abbot. Posting into Gloucestershire, he then visited the old and characteristic priory of Lanthony and Lantonia Secunda, the second and more extensive retreat of the black canons of the original Antony of Monmouthshire, who had fled thither in bygone ages from the hostilities of the Welch. The annual income of this abode of religion was 750 pounds. The site was soon given afterwards to Sir Arthur Porter. Peter took the surrender of 25 religious, as he wrote, to inform Cromwell with as much quietness as might be desired. And shortly afterwards, he proceeded to London to report progress to the vice gerent in person. Continuing his journey southward, he dissolved in the new forest, the Cistercian House de Bella Loco, in number 20, 400 pounds in revenue, and the Austin House of Southwick in the same region of 13 cannons and 300 pounds, of which sites were given to Ryoth Thessaly and to one John Rock White. Returning thence, he put an end to the troubled existence of Kenilworth, where 17 monks resigned an income of 600 pounds. Sir Andrew Flannock was gifted with the site of their superb abode. He dissolved well back in Nottinghamshire, which held the superiority in England of the whole prime and Stratensian order, or order of white canons, a house of 19 religious, but of less than an annual value of 300 pounds, of which the site was bestowed on one Richard Whaley. He added to the ruin of the Cistercians in Yorkshire, the destruction of the abbey, or Roch of Deroop near Doncaster, of 18 cowls. He smote Walsingham in Norfolk, one of the most famous places of pilgrimage in the kingdom, with the curious chapel built in imitation of that in Nazareth. The annual value of this place, which belonged to the black cannons, was somewhat under 500 pounds. The offerings to Our Lady varied from 260 to less than 30 pounds a year. The value of the capture might have been diminished by the previous diligence of Richard Southwell, one of the best of Cromwell's tools, who had been there two years before and had sequestered all the money, plate, jewels, and stuff that he could find. The site was granted to Thomas Sidney. After these miscellaneous victories over many orders began that service, 
with which the name of Peter deserves to be associated forever. The almost total extirpation of the Gilbertines, the only religious order that was of English origin. In the middle of the 12th century, Sir Gilbert, clergyman of the English church, the son of Sir Jocelyn of Semprincham, instituted a new model of the religious life in which, by a refinement of celibacy, similar to that practiced among the Brigatites, both monks and nuns inhabited separate parts of the same buildings. From the Earl of Lincoln, he obtained a grant of land at Semperingham, on which he built a priory. The order grew and prospered until nearly 30 houses had arisen to perpetuate the name and discipline of the founder. In one of the least of these composite establishments, the monastic life was as ill-supported as might be expected under such peculiar conditions, but the primitive model appears to have been abandoned in most of them, and with the exception of two or three, the Gilbertine houses at the time of the dissolution consisted only of monks. Several of them were fallen already when Peter proceeded to destroy the capital of the order at Semperingham. <coughs> Holgate, the Bishop of Landaff, was commendatory prior of this house and master of the whole order. Seventeen monks, but no nuns are specified, concurred in the surrender. The value was reported at 300 pounds a year. Peter pursued them throughout the ancestral county of Lincolnshire in their settlements of Haverholm, Catley, Bullington, Six Hill, Ormsby, and Newstead, and Lindsay. In Nottinghamshire, he destroyed their seat at Mattersea. To these may be added, furthermore, the priories of Alvingham in Lincolnshire, of St. Andrew in the city of York, of Ellerton in Yorkshire, which either surrendered themselves without waiting the approach of the visitor or were dissolved by the commissioners of the county. All these establishments, except the last, had Holgate for their commendator. Most of them were small, being under the value of 100 pounds a year and under the number of 12 religious persons. If the surrenderies be taken for any index, there were no nuns in any of these houses. Their sites were divided between Lord Clinton Duke of Suffolk, the act of Peter, like Leg, like Leighton, finished a glorious year in London where he dissolved the hospital of St. Thomas of Aachen in the Cheap and the nunnery of St. Helen in Bishopsgate Street, the one on the pious foundation of the sister of Thomas Becket in memory of her brother in one of the great schools of London, the other a Benedictine sisterhood. Their chapels still remain. Their sites were granted respectively to William Gonson and Sir Richard Cromwell, alias Williams, the nephew of the vice regent. One crowning transaction yet remains, which will endow us with the privilege of beholding the three worthies whose footsteps we have been following. Associated in a common undertaking and un overcoming a difficulty by a united skill, the great mitred Abbey of St. Albans, of which the church spared to parochial use, has lately undergone a skillful restoration and has been raised to the dignity of an Episcopal see. was visited in the month of December by Legg and Peter in conjunction, it would appear, with some other commissioners. On the day of their coming, the abbot, Stevenage by name, happened to be away in London. In his absence, they took the opportunity of examining the convent at full length, because they should know more of the state of all things. And the next day, when their interrogations were concluded, they sent for the abbot. He arrived on the day after and was subjected in his turn to a severe investigation. It was found that the injunctions had not been obeyed, that there were manifest dilapidations, making of shifts neglect, negligent 
administration and sundry other causes which were not more distinctly specified for depriving the abbot. The visitors, however, were willing to have provided by the gentler method of inducing him to give up the house peacefully, but by what means they knew not, they found that all suggestions, all intimations, all communications touching the surrender and a pension were stiffly resisted. And the abbot told them roundly that he would rather choose to beg his bread all the days of his life than to consent to a surrender. They communed with him severally, and altogether they used such motives as they thought might further their purpose. But he always continued one man, nay, he never waxed ever more obstinate and less conformable. In these trying circumstances, they cried aloud for Leighton that Cromwell should send Leighton to let them know the king's pleasure in their business, and thus Legg and Peter owned in Leighton one greater than themselves. Leighton appears to have prevailed. The abbot was induced to fix his name to a surrender which had previously been signed by the convent. The house was dissolved, and the 37 monks who composed it took their departure from their ancient home. The venerable foundation of King Offa, valued at more than 2,000 a year, was confiscated and dismantled, all but the church, and the church was purified from the memory of the proto-martyr of the island. The vast and magnificent shrine of St. Elban was shattered into a thousand pieces. The jewels and ornaments with which it was glittered were carried to the king. The annals of the caterpillar and the palm worm cannot be but monotonous. Neither the progress nor the magnitude of the revolution can be understood without the minutes, and the afflicted reader must be content to follow the course of the creatures who are eating their way in different directions through length and breadth of the land. The full splendor of Dr. Tregonwell was reserved for another year, but in this year he suppressed Kingswood and Gloucestershire and Port Robert and Sussex of the number of 13 and 9 respectively, both of greater value, both of the Cistercian order. The Cistercian house of Cogshaw in Essex of about 250 pounds fell to Capel and Wentworth, who seemed to have been mere ordinary commissioners the site of which was granted to Sir Thomas Seymour. One Ashton, an agent of the experter type, was the destroyer of the large Benedictine house of Walden in Essex, valued about 400 pounds a year, which was granted in full to the Lord Chancellor Audley. The prior who surrendered the place was commendatory, more by name, the suffragan of Colchester, and not, and some not unskillful dealings may be discerned between him and Audley. On the one hand, advantageous exchanges of land were made by Audley with Col Colchester Abbey, and on the other hand, more was put into the archdeaconry of Leicester, for which Audley offered to give the Bishop of Hereford 80 pounds to resign some claim which he had in the election. Audley obtained afterwards the house of the crossed friars in Colchester. To this year it is probable may be assigned the suppression of Benham and Beeston in Norfolk, in which the remarkable Sir Richard Rich was concerned. A former of them of about 150 pounds had escaped hitherto by alleging that it was a cell of St. Albans, a true statement which Rich denied. The latter, some three or four Austin cannons with 50 pounds among them, pretended that they were not Austin cannons, but Austin friars, a falsehood which, which Rich exposed. Thomas Weatherall, a chancery clerk, brought to a surrender Rudolph Hartley, the prior of Weatherall in Cumberland, a cell of eight black monks, which appears in the Comperta of the smaller value which was granted two years later to the dean and chapter of Carlisle. 
Robert Southwell, an eminent name, brought to more perfect terms the priory of West Acre in Norfolk, of nine black canons in the Abbey of Boxley in Kent. They were about the same value, upwards of 200 pounds a year. Recites were given to the Duchess of Richmond and to Sir Thomas Wyatt. Several other monasteries were surrendered of themselves or to some unrecorded visitor. They were Hammond in Shropshire, a house of nine persons, Workshop in Nottinghamshire of 16, in Herefordshire, Wigmore, Faversham and Kemp, the one of 10, the other of nine. In Yorkshire, the Cluniac Monk Breton of 14, Augustinian Kirkham, and Bolton of 18 and 15, Byland and Rival of 25 to 23, both Cistercian, the latter the original seat of the great order in England, were dissolved by the commissioner of Alassus and his fellows. They were all about the same value, under or over 300 pounds a year, and to them may be added Biddleston in Buckinghamshire, a small house of 11 which had been refounded by the king. Here we find perhaps the earliest use of that formulated confession, which became the standard among the few religious houses in which surrender was accompanied by confession. Whether this standard were supplied to them or invented by their own ingenuity, the reader may determine. It was much shorter than the confession of St. Andrews <clears throat> it contained no admission of moral depravity. The religious houses that adopted it affirmed that they were moved to return to the world by profoundly considering the vanity of their religion, the folly of their ceremonies, <clears throat> <clears throat> or the inconsistency of their dependence on a foreign potentate. But of obscenity they said nothing. And this model, which it may be observed, was used only by houses which voluntarily surrendered themselves, is the only confession in the original form subscribed by the hands of those who made it, which has ever been produced from first to start, last in proof of the alleged depravity of the English monasteries. It is known to have been made by six houses in all. The impetuosity of the recruit is not always equal to services which try the seasoned valor of the veteran. Richard Ingworth, formerly a prior of Langley, Regis, the richest establishment of the Black Friars in the kingdom, was promoted to be Bishop Suffragan of Duffer, Dover, at the end of 1537. Receiving the commission of a visitor soon afterwards, Ingworth appears to have conceived the ambition of becoming the hammer of the friars. He exclaimed that if he were given scope and verge enough, there should be few houses of friars left standing in England, or seemed it unlikely that he would fulfill his word before the first Sunday in the following Lent, 1538, he'd conveyed to the king the four houses of friars at Boston and Lincolnshire the Austin Friars and four more houses in the city of Lincoln itself for the end of May been at Northampton, Coventry, Atherton, Warwickshire, Warwick, Droitwich, and Worcester. And here will come no end. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost.